Sagas Kalya Grim Sonar Egil Saga Chapter 1 of Kveldulf and his sons There was a man named Ulf, son of Bjorf and Holbera, the daughter of Ulf the Fearless and sister of Halbjorn Half-Giant. Ulf was a man so tall and strong that none could match him, and in his youth he sailed the dark and rolling seas raiding and pillaging, thundering and burning. With him was Kari of Birdla, a strong and brave man, a fellow berserker. Ulf and he shared all their spoils and were close and trusted friends. When they both gave up raiding, Kari went to his estate at Birdla as a man of great wealth. Three children had Kari, one son, Nimaven Lam, another, Olvirnuf, and a daughter, Sarbjörg, who was a most beautiful woman of noble spirit. So beautiful that Ulf took her as his wife, and she went to his estates with him. Wealthy he was, both in lands and chattel. He took Baron's rank, as his forefathers had done, and became a great man of renown. It was told of Ulf that he was a grand householder. It was his wont to rise up early, then go round among his laborers and smiths, and overlook his stock and fields, and at times he would talk with those that needed his counsel and good counsel he could give on all things, for he was very wise. But every day as evening drew on, he became sullen, so that few could come to speak with him. He was an evening sleeper, and it was commonly said that he was a shapeshifter. He was called Kveldulf, which means Night Wolf. Veldulf and his wife had two sons. The elder was named Thorolf, the younger Grim. These, when they grew up, were both tall and strong like their father. But while Thorolf was most handsome, favoring his mother's kin, Grim was dark and brooding, ill-favored like his father both in face and mind. He became a good man of business, skillful was he in wood and iron an excellent smith and herring fisherman. But when Thorolf was twenty years old, he made ready to go raiding. Kveldulf gave him a long ship, and Kari of Birdless sons, Eivind and Orva, resolved to go on that voyage, taking a large force and another long ship, and they sailed the seas in the summer, and took wealth and plunder, which they divided up among themselves. For several summers they were out raiding, but stayed at home in winter with their fathers. Thorolf brought home many costly things and took them to his father and mother. Thus they were well to do both for possessions and honor. Kveldulf was now well stricken in years, and his sons were grown men. Chapter 2 of Olvirnuf Odbjorn was then king over the Firth Folk. There was an earl of his named Rold, whose son was Thorir. Atli the Slim was then an earl. He dwelt at Gala. He had sons, Holstein, Holmstein, and Hurstein, and a daughter, Solvig the Fair. It happened one autumn that much people were gathered at Gala for a sacrificial feast. Then saw Olvir Nuf Solvig and courted her. He afterwards asked her to be his wife. But the Earl thought him an unequal match and would not give her. Whereupon Olvir composed many love songs and thought so much of Solvig that he left raiding to be with her. But Thorolf and Avon Lamb had no such mind to give up. They continued their raiding.
Chapter 3 The Beginning of the Rule of Harald Fairhair Harald, son of Halfdan the Black, was heir to his father's kingdom. Harald had bound himself by a strange vow, a vow not to let his hair be cut or combed till he were the sole king over all of Norway, wherefore he was called Harald Tanglehair. So first he warred with the kings nearest to him and conquered them, as is told at length elsewhere. Then he got possession of Upland, thence he went northwards to Trondheim, and had many battles there before he became absolute ruler over all the thrones. After that he went north to Naumdal to attack the brothers Herlog and Rolog, kings of Naumdal. But when these brothers heard of his coming, Herlog with twelve men entered the sepulchral mound, which they had been building for the last three winters, and then the mound was closed after them. But King Rolog sank from royalty to earldom, giving up his kingdom and becoming a vassal of Harald. So Harald gained the Gnomsdalen men in the Holgeland, and he set rulers over his realm there. Then he went southwards with a fleet to Mera and Raumsdal, but Solvi Bandilegs, Huthiof's son, escaped and travelled secretly to King Arnvid in South Mera. He asked help with these words. Though this danger now touches us, before long the same will come to you, for Harald, as I see, will hasten hither when he is enthralled and oppressed after his will all in North Mera and Romsdal. Then will the same need be upon you as was upon us to guard your wealth and liberty, and to try everyone from whom you may hope for aid. And I now offer myself with my forces against this tyranny and wrong. But if you make the other choice, you must do as the Gnomes Dalsmen have done, and go of your own will into slavery, and become Harald's thralls. My father, though at victory to die a king with honor rather than become in his old age another king's subject, though as I judge, will think the same, and so will others who have any high spirit and claim to be men of valor. By such persuasion, King Arnvid was determined to gather his forces and defend his land. He and Solvi made a league and sent messengers to Oddbjorn, king of the Firth Folk, that he should come and help them. Oddbjorn, after counsel taken with friends, consented, and bade cut the war arrow and send the war summons throughout his realm, with word to his nobles that they should join him. But when the king's messengers came to Kveldulf and told him their errand, and that the king would have Kveldulf come to him with all his housecarls, then he answered, It is my duty to the king to take the field with him if he have to defend his own land, and there be harrying against the Firth folk. But this I deem clean beyond my duty to go north to Mara and defend their land. Briefly ye may say, when ye meet your king, that Kveldulf will sit at home during this rush to war, nor will he gather forces, nor leave his home to fight with Harald Tanglehair. For I think that he has a whole load of good fortune where our king has not a handful. The messengers went back to the king, and told him how their errand had sped. But Kveldulf sat at home on his estates. Chapter 4 Battle of King Harald and Ardbjorn King Ardbjorn went with his forces northwards to Mora. There he joined King Arnvid and Solvi Bandilegs, and altogether they had a large host. King Harald also had come from the north with his forces, and the armies met inside Solskil. There was fought a great battle, with much slaughter on either side. Of the Morian forces fell the kings Arnvid and Ardbjorn, 
but Solvi escaped and afterwards became a great sea rover and wrought much scathe on Harold's kingdom and was nicknamed Bandy Legs. On Harald's side fell two earls, Asgard and Asbjorn, and two sons of Earl Hakon, Gjotjard and Herlog, and many other great men. After this, Harald subdued South Mora. Vemund, Odbjorn's brother, still retained the Firth folk, being made king. It was now autumn, and King Harald was advised not to go south in autumn tide, so he set Earl Ronvald over north and south Mora and Ramsdal, and kept a numerous force about himself. That same autumn the sons of Atli set on Olver Nuf at his home, would fain have slain him. They had such a force that Olver could not withstand them and fled for his life. Going northwards to Mora, he there found Harald and submitted to him, and went north with the king to Trondheim, and he became most friendly with him, and remained with him for a long time thereafter, and he was made a scold. In the winter following Earl Ronvald went the inner way by the Eid Sea southwards to the Firths, Having news by spies of the movements of King Vermund, he came by night to Nostal, where Vermund was at a banquet and surrounded the house and burnt within it the king and his ninety men. After that, Karl of Birdler came to Earl Ronvald with a long ship fully manned, and they too went north to Mora. Ronvald took the ships that it belonged to Vermund and all the chattels he could get. Kari of Birdler then went north to King Harald at Trondheim and became his man. Next spring, King Harald went southwards along the coast with a fleet and subdued firths and fells and arranged for men of his own to rule them. Earl of Rold, he set over the firth folk King Harald was very careful, when he had gotten new peoples under his power, about barons and rich landowners, and all those whom he suspected of being at all likely to raise rebellion. Every such man he treated in one of two ways. He either made him become his liege man, or go abroad, or as a third choice, suffer yet harder conditions, some even losing life or limb. Harald claimed as his own through every district all patrimonies and all land tilled or untilled, likewise all seas and freshwater lakes. All landowners were to be his tenants, as all that worked in the forest, salt burners, hunters and fishers by land and sea. All these owed him duty, but many fled abroad from this tyranny and much waste land was then colonized far and wide, both eastwards in Jomtland and Helsingland, and also the Westlands, the Southern Isles, Dublin in Ireland, Caithness in Scotland, and Shetland, and in time, Iceland was found. Chapter 5 The King's Message to Kveldulf King Harald lay with his fleet in the Firths, whence he sent messengers round the land. The messengers came to Kveldulf and were well received. They set forth their errand, said that the king would have Kveldulf come to him. He has heard, said they, that you are a man of renown and high family. You will get from him terms of great honor, for the king is very keen on this, to have with him such as he hears are men of mark for strength and bravery. Kveldulf answered that he was an old man, not fit for war or to be in war ships. I will now, said he, sit at home and leave serving kings. Upon this the messenger said, Then let your son go to the king. He is a tall man and likely warrior. 
the king will make you a baron, said they to Grimm, if you will serve him. I will be made baron under none, said Grimm, while my father lives, he, while he lives, shall be my liege lord. The messengers went away, and when they came to the king, told him all that Kveldulf had said before them, whereat the king looked sullen, but he spoke little. These men, he said, were proud, or what were they aiming at? Orver Nuf was standing near, and he bade the king not to be wrath. I will go, said he, to Kveldulf, and he will consent to come to you, as soon as he knows that you think it a matter of importance. So Orvir went to Kveldulf and told him that the king was wrath, and it would not go well unless one of the two, father or son, came to the king. He said, too, that he would get them great honor from the king if they would but pay homage. Further, he told them at length was true that the king was liberal to his men, both in money and in honors. Kveldulf said, My foreboding is that I and my sons shall get no luck from this king, and I will not go to him. But if Thorolf returns this summer, he will be easily won to this journey, as also to be made the king's man. Say you this to the king, that I will be his friend, and will keep to his friendship all who heed my words. I will also hold the same rule and authority from his hand that I held before the former king, if he will that it continue so still, and I will see how I and the king agree. Then Olvir went back and told the king that Kveldulf would send him his son, and he said, That would suit you better, but he was not then at home. The king let the matter rest. In the summer he went inland to Sohn, but in autumn made ready to go northwards to Trondheim. Chapter 6 Thorolf Resolves to Serve the King Thorolf Kveldulfsson and Avon Lam came home from sea roving in the autumn. Thorolf went to his father, and the father and son had some talk together. Thorolf asked what had been seen of the errand of the men whom Harald sent thither. Kveldulf said the king had sent them with this message, that Kveldulf, or else one of his sons, should become his serving man. How answered thou, said Thorolf, I spake what was in my mind, that I would never take service with the king Harald, and yet too will do both the same. If I may counsel, this I think will be the end, that we shall reap ruin from that king. That, said Thorolf, is quite contrary to what my mind tells me, for I think I shall get from him much advancement, and on this I am resolved to seek the king and become his man, and this I have learnt for true, that his guard is made up of none but valiant men. To join their company, if they will have me, seems to be most desirable. These men are in far better case than all others in the land, and tis told me of the king that he is most generous in money gifts to his men, and not slow to give them promotion, to grant rule to such as he deems that meet it. Whereas I hear this about all that turn their backs upon him, and pay him not homage with friendship, that they all become men of naught, some flee abroad, some are made hirelings. It seems wonderful to me, father, in a man so wise and ambitious as you are, that thou would not thankfully take the dignity which the king offered you. But if thou thinkest that thou hast prophetic foresight in this, that we shall get misfortune from this king, and that he will be our enemy, then why did you not go to battle against that king in whose service you went before? Now methinks it is most unreasonable neither to be his friend nor his enemy. It went, said Kveldulf, just as my mind foreboded, that they marched not to victory who went northwards to fight with Harold Tanglehair and Mora, and equally true with this, that Harald will work much scathe on my kin. But thou, Thorolf, 
will take thine own counsel in thine own business, nor do I fear thou enter into the company of Harald's guard, that you will not be thought capable and equal to the foremost in all proofs of manhood. Only beware of this, keep within bounds, nor rival thy betters, thou wilt not, I am sure, yield to others overmuch. But when Thorolf made him ready to go, Gveldulf accompanied him down to the ship and embraced him, with wishes for his happy journey and their next merry meeting. Chapter 7 of Björgolf Brynjolf Bard in Hildreda There was a man in Halogolin named Björgolf. He dwelt in Torgar. He was a baron, powerful and wealthy, in strength, stature, and kindred half hill giant. He had a son named Birnjolf, who was like his father. Björgolf was now old, and his wife was dead and he had given over into his son's hands all business, and found him a wife, Helga, daughter of Ketelhain and Rafnister. Their son was named Bard. He soon grew to be tall and handsome, and became a right doughty man. One autumn there was a banquet where many men were gathered, Björgolf and his son being there the most honorable guests. In the evening, they were paired off by lot to drink together, as was the old custom. Now there was at the banquet a man named Hogni, owner of a farm in Lekka, a man of great wealth, very handsome, shrewd, but of low family, who had made his own way. He had a most beautiful daughter, Hilderida by name, and it fell to her lot to sit by Björgolf. They talked much together that evening, and the fair maiden charmed the old man. Shortly afterwards, the banquet broke up. That same autumn, old Björgolf journeyed from home in a cutter of his own, with thirty men aboard. He came to Lekka, and twenty of them went out to the house, while ten guarded the ship. When they came to the farm, Hogni went out to meet them, and made him welcome, invited him and his comrades to the lodge, which offer Björgolf accepted, and they entered the room. But when they had doffed their traveling clothes and donned mantles, then Hogni gave orders to bring in a large bowl of beer, and Hildreda, the daughter of the house, bare ale to the guests. Björgolf called to him Hogni the good man, and said, my errand here is this, I will have your daughter to go home with me, and we will even now make with her a hasty wedding. Hogni saw no choice but to let all be as Björgolf would, so Björgolf bought her with an ounce of gold, and they became man and wife, and Hildurida went home with Björgolf to Torgar. Brynjolf showed him ill-pleased at these business. Björgolf and Hildurida had two sons, one was named Harek, the other Heirik. Soon after this Björgolf died, but no sooner was he buried than Brynjolf sent away for Hildurida and her sons. She went to her father at Lekka, and there her sons were brought up. They were good-looking, small of stature, naturally shrewd like their mother's kin. They were commonly called Hildurida's sons. Brynjolf made little count of them, and did not let them inherit aught of his father's. Hildurida was Hogni's heiress, and she and her sons inherited from him and dwelt in Lekka, and had plenty of wealth. Bard, Brynjolf's son, and Hildurida's son were about of the same age. Björgolf and his son Brynjolf had long held the office of going to the Finns and collecting the Finns' tribute. Northwards in Hologoland is a firth called Befsnir, and in the firth lies an island called Lost, a large island and a good one, and in this a farm called Sunness. There dwelt a man named Sigurd, the richest man thereabouts in the north, he was a baron, and wise of understanding. He had a daughter named Sigrider. 
she was thought the best match in Hologland, being his only child and sole heiress to her father. Bod Brynjolf's son journeyed from home with a cutter and thirty men aboard northwards to a lost, and came to Sigurd at Sandness. There he declared his business, and asked Sigrida to wife. This offer was well received and favorably answered, and so it came about that Bod was betrothed to the maiden. The marriage was to take place the next summer. Bard was then to come home north for the wedding. Chapter 8 of Bard and Thorolf King Harald had that summer sent word to the men of power that were in Hologoland, summoning to him such as had not come to him before. Brynjolf resolved to go, and with him Bard his son, and in the autumn they went southwards to Trondheim, and there met the king. He received them most gladly. Brynjolf was made a baron of the king's. The king also gave him large grants beside what he had before. He gave him withal the right of journey to the Finns with the king's business on the fells and the Finn traffic. Then Brynjolf went away home to his estate, but Bard remained and was made one of the king's guard. Of all his guard, the king most prized his scolds. They occupied the second high seat. Of these, Odin ill scold sat in a most, being the oldest. He had been scold to Halfdan Swarthy, or Halfdan the Black, King Harald's father. Next to him sat Thornbjorn Raven, then Orvir Nuf, and next to him was placed Bard. He was thereby named Bard the White, or Bard the Strong. He was in honor with everyone there, but between him and Orvir Nuf was a close friendship. That same autumn came to King Harald Thorolf Kveldorf's son and Avon Lam, Kari of Birdler's son, and they were well received. They brought thither a swift twenty bench long ship well manned, which they had before used in sea roving. They and their company were placed in the guest hall, but when they had waited there till they thought it fit time to go before the king, Kari of Birdler and Orvir Nuf went in with them. They greeted the king, then said Orvir Nuf, Here is come Kveldulf's son, whom I told thee in the summer Kveldulf would send. His promise to thee will now stand fast, for here thou canst see true tokens that he will be thy friend in all when he hath sent his son hither to take service with thee, a stalwart man as you may be. Now this is the boon craved by Kveldulf and by us all, that you receive Thorolf with honor and make him a great man with you. The king answered his words well, promising that he would do so, if, he said, Thorolf proves himself as accomplished indeed as he is right brave in look. After this, Thorolf was made one of the king's household and of his guard. But Kari of Birdla and his son Avon Lam went back south in the ship which Thorolf had brought north, and so home to Kari's farm. Thorolf remained with the king, who appointed him a seat between Ovir Nuf and Bard, and these three struck up a close friendship. And all men said of Thorolf and Bard that they were a well-matched pair for comeliness, stature, strength, and all good deeds, and both were in high favor with the king. But when winter was past and summer came, the Bard asked leave to go and see the marriage proposed to him the summer before. And when the king knew that Bard's errand was urgent, he allowed him to go home. Then Bard asked Thorolf to go north with him, saying that he would meet there many of his kin, men of renown, whom he had not yet seen or known. 
Thorolf thought this desirable, so they got leave from the king for this. Then they made them ready, took a good ship and crew, and went on their way. When they came to Torgar, they sent word to Sigurd the Bard, who now see to the marriage on which they had agreed the summer before. Sigurd said that he would hold to all that they had arranged. So they fixed the wedding day, and Bard with his party were to come north to Sonnes. At the appointed time, Brynjolf and Bard set out, and with many men, great men of their kin and connections. And it was as Bard had said, that Thorolf met there many of his kinsmen that he had not known before. They journeyed to Sonnes, and there was held slip and most splendid feast. And when the feast was ended, Bard went home with his wife and remained at home through the summer, and Thorolf stayed with him. In the autumn they came south to the king, and were there with him another winter. During that winter Brynjolf died, and when Bard learned that the inheritance there was open for him, he asked leave to go home. This the king granted. Before they parted, Bard was made a baron, as his father had been, and held of the king all those same grants that Brynjolf had held. Bard went home to his estate, and at once became a great chief, but Hildurida's son got no more of the heritage than before. Bard had a son by his wife. He was named Grim. Meanwhile, Thorolf was with the king, and in great honor. Chapter 9 Battle in Harfras Firth King Harald proclaimed a general levy and gathered a fleet, summoning his forces far and wide through the land. He went out from Trondheim and bent his course southwards, for he had heard that a large host was gathered throughout Ogdir, Rogaland, and Hordaland, assembled from far both from the inland parts above and from the east out of Vik, and many great men were there met with purpose to defend their land from the king. Harald held on his way from the north with a large force having his guards on board. In the forecastle of the king's ship were Thor of Kveldorfsen, Bard the White, Kari of Birdless Sons, Orvir Nuf, and even Lamb and in the prow were twelve berserkers of the king. Fleets met south in Rogaland and Harfras Firth. There was fought the greatest battle that King Harald had, with much slaughter on either side. The king set his own ship in the van, and there the battle was most stubborn, but the end was that King Harald won the victory. Thor Longchin king of Ogdir fell there, but Kjotvi the wealthy fled with all his men that could stand, save some that surrendered after the battle. When the roll of Harald's army was called, many were there that had fallen, and many more were wounded. Thorolf was badly wounded, barred even worse, nor was there a man unwounded in the king's ship before the mast except those whom iron bit not to wit the berserkers. Then the king had his men's wounds bound up and thanked them for their valor and gave them gifts, adding most praise where he thought it most deserved. He promised them all further honor, naming some to be steersmen, others forecastlemen, others bow-sitters. This was the last battle King Harald had within the land. After this, none withstood him. He was supreme over all Norway. The king saw to the healing of his men, whose wounds gave them hope of life, as also to the burial of the dead with all customary honors. Thorolf and Bard lay wounded, Thorolf's wounds began to heal, but Bard's proved mortal. Then Bard had the king called to him and spoke. 
If it be so that I die of these wounds, then I would ask this of thee, that I may myself name my heir. To this, when the king assented, he said, I will that Thorolf, my friend and kinsman, take all my heritage, both lands and chattels. To him also will I give my wife and the bringing up of my son, because I trust him for this above all other men. This arrangement he made fast, as the law was with this the leave of the king. Then Bard died, and was buried, and his death was much mourned. Thorolf was healed of his wounds, and followed the king, and had won great glory. In the autumn the king went north to Trondheim. Then Thorolf asked to go north to Alogeland to see after those gifts which he had received in the summer from his kinsman Bard. The king gave leave for this, adding a message and tokens that Thorolf should take all the Bard had given him, showing that the gift was the counsel of the king, and that he too would have it so. Then the king gave Thorolf a baron, and granted him all the rights which Bard had had before, giving him the journey to the Finns on the same terms. He also supplied to Thorolf a good long ship, with tackling complete, and had everything made ready for his journey thence in the best possible way. So Thorolf set out, and he and the king parted with great affection. But when Thorolf came north to Torgar, he was well received. He told them of Bard's death and also how Bard had left him both lands and chattel, and her had been his wife. Then he showed the king's orders and tokens. When Sigurida heard these tidings, she felt her great loss in her husband, but with Thorolf she was already well acquainted, and knew him for a man of great mark. And this promise of her in marriage was good, and besides there was the king's command. So she and her friends sought to the best plan that she should be betrothed to Thorolf, unless there was against her father's mind. Thereupon Thorolf took all the management of the property, and also the king's business. Soon after this Thorolf started with a long ship and about sixty men, and coasted northwards, till one day at eventide he came to St. Ness in a lost and there they moored the ship. And when they had raised their tent and made arrangements, Thorolf went up to the farm buildings with twenty men. Sigurd received him well, and asked him to lodge there, for there had been great intimacy between them since the marriage connection between Sigurd and Bard. Then Thorolf and his men went to the hall, and where they were entertained. Sigurd sat and talked with Thorolf and asked tidings. Thorolf told of the battle fought that summer in the south, and of the fall of many men whom Sigurd knew well, and how Bard's son-in-law had died of wounds received in the battle. This they both felt to be a great loss. Then Thorolf told Sigurd, what had been the covenant between him and Bard before he died, and he declared also the orders of the king, how he would have all this hold good, and he showed him the tokens. After this Thorolf entered on his wooing with Sigurd, and asked Sigurd, his daughter, to wife. Sigurd received the proposal well. He said there were many reasons for this. First, the king would have it so. Next, Bard had asked it, and further, he himself knew Thorolf well, and thought it a good match for his daughter. Thus Sigurd was easily won to grant the suit, whereupon the betrothal was made, and the wedding was fixed for the autumn at Torgar. Then Thorolf went home to his estate, and his comrades with him. There he prepared a great feast, and bade many there too. Of Thorolf's kin, many were present, men of renown. Sigurd also came thither from the north with a long ship and a chosen crew. 
numerously attended was that feast, and it was at once seen that Thorolf was free-handed and munificent. He kept about him a large following, whereof the cost was great, and much provision was needed. But the year was good, and needful supplies were easily found. During that winter Sigurd died at St. Ness, and Thorolf was here, there heir to the property. This was great wealth. Now the sons of Hildurida came to Thorolf, and put in the claim which they thought they had to the property that belonged to their father, Björgolf. Thorolf answered them thus, This I knew of Brynjolf, and still better of Bard, that they were men so generous that they would have let you have all of Björgolf's heritage, what share they knew to be your right. I was present when you two put in the same claim on Bard, and I heard what he thought, and that there was no ground for it, for he called you illegitimate. Harek said that they would bring witnesses that their mother was duly bought with payment. It is true that we did not at first treat of this matter with Brynjolf, our brother. It was a case of sharing between kinsmen, but of Bard we hoped to get our dues in every respect, though our dealings with him were not for too long. Now, however, this heritage has come to men who are no wise our kin, and we cannot be altogether silent about our wrong, but it may be that, as before, might will so prevail that we got not our right of thee in this, if you refuse to hear the witness that we can bring to prove us honorably born. Thorolf then answered angrily, So far as I am from thinking, you legitimate heirs, that I am told your mother was taken by force and carried home as a captive. After that they left talking altogether. together.